This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Bakers, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Bakers worth it every time. Bakers, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Hashtag no music, no intro. Another episode of Hashtag Saints Twitter podcast. We are blessed with the presence of e- ESPN's own Mike Triplett, Big Trip, Trips. Um, there's probably a different, a tons of combinations of name or names I could come up with, but we're not going to get into that. Uh, <laughs> this is like your second or third. No, I think this is your third time on the mm-hmm. pod. So you are in a. That feels right. In an elite class, um, but I don't even want to talk about the Saints. I want to talk about this promotion that you got at ESPN, where you're not just the Saints reporter. Now that's Captain Terrell. You're like the NFL guy. Like this man's making moves. So first, we wanted to like officially give you congratulations um, about that and how how that even came about. Well, it's still, I'm going to wait and talk about it when I make the switch, but I'm actually, I'm going to continue to cover the Saints. So uh, okay. uh, in, in the meantime, in the meantime, I'm, I'm bouncing around doing a lot of fantasy stuff with ESPN too, which is something I've always been passionate about doing, but, uh, but no, uh, uh, you can have me on again uh, uh, when, when we can talk about the next move next, but I, I'm not going to leave. I'm not, I'll still be heavily involved in the Saints coverage. So. Oh, good. And that's a good. Little- that's something I wanted to ask because I was thinking about it all day today and I was like, how long have you been covering the Saints? Because I feel like it's been yeah. almost as long as I've been a fan, which is a long time. No, I well, so I'll give you a little funny backstory. Uh, um, when I started work and I was out in, in the Bay Area and I covered like the A's and the 49ers and the Sacramento Kings, like all when those teams got, got good. And uh, then I moved down here and I started covering LSU football uh in 03 when they won the championship lsu women's basketball they go to the final four lsu college baseball they go to the college world series and everybody's like oh you got to cover the saints man they need you and i started covering the saints in 2005 and katrina hit and they went (laughs) three and 13 (laughs) but it's been good ever since then so i'm still gonna take the credit (laughs) no no i mean i mean honestly that that i weirdly that changed the game and you know, it you know brought in Sean Payton and Drew Brees, and you know just a whole new era for Saints fans, where you know kids that are like twenty, you know twenty five and under, all they know is like a winning Saints team. You know, like that's that's their Saints experience. So it's kind of so, weird. It's, crazy. It's, it's so wild to me. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Well, I look, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I kind of enjoy. You guys can feel this as well as anyone. I bet. I kind of enjoy the the fan optimism uh, right now, and I think I think signing two LSU players had a lot to do with it. But mm-hmm. I, I'll tell you what my least favorite little period was was they were flirting with a little entitlement, you know, like mm-hmm. when the twelve and four seasons weren't good enough. Uh, that gets a little rough. That gets a little rough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. It's like because, like I mean that that stretch like from two thousand seventeen. It's like thirteen and three. Like, oh well, who cares? Like Super Bowl, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Which is it's it's just comes with success. It's, it's weird. weird. It's tough. Now, look, I mean, they they were historic. It was historic that they never went to a Super Bowl. I I, I think I think they either tied the record or set the record for most most wins in a four year span without reaching a Super Bowl. So wow. it was tough. That's like a different. Oh. That's like a different oh. kind of misery. Man, that's that, a different kind of misery. That's, that's, yeah, that's right. kind of painful. That's that's a different type. Of yeah, pain. it is. It is. It's a different kind of painful. <laughs> yeah. But look, there. Here's the thing. Tom Brady has ruined it, the standard for everyone because yeah. nobody else 
has gone twice. Like Air Rodgers, one. He's got one Super Bowl appearance. Russell Wilson, one win. One win and one loss. Peyton Manning with the Colts, one win. Like, that's everybody except yeah. Tom Brady and the Patriots. <laughs> it's it's absolutely – it's wild. Like you said, like Tom Brady – as it's skewed, it's they, he's 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 messed up the curve. I feel oh, yeah. in terms of like having like an actual intellectual type of conversation when it comes to sports and championships. Because anyone who just knows sports just knows a it's super hard to win a championship, and then two, there's so much type of luck that's involved in terms of health, and sometimes just the ball sometimes goes your way in a season. Um, like I'm not gonna say that it doesn't matter about like play and and talent and and rosters and all that, but there's there's something to it as well, and it just kind of shows just how difficult it is because you know the Saints haven't haven't won one since 2000, 2009. But that's a question I wanted to start off with you. So you've been with the Saints since 2005. Me and Ryan have talked about this a little bit on the show in regards to that training camp 2009 even remembering how we even got our training cap news back then, you just reading Saints report or whatever it was, you just kind of felt like something was different about the team. Um, I think I could say for myself, I felt something different about the team. Also 2011 um, when they went on, had a great season ended in San Francisco. I actually went to like four of their practices when they were at Oxnard out here in California. And from the outside, just reading observations, it seems like this currently constructed Saints team may kind of have those same vibes. So someone who's seen this team practice on a day-to-day in training camp, do you get, get a kind of similar vibe from this training camp to maybe 2009, 2011? No, I, I'm not going to go that far only because 2011, I, I – I think I think it might be the best offense in NFL history. Uh, they've still got the record for most yards in a season, even when they expanded to 17 games last year. I mean, when we go down that list, Jimmy Graham, Darren Sproul, like Mark Ingram's the fourth running back, Pierre Thomas, Chris Ivory, uh, 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 Robert Meacham's the fourth receiver, and Jimmy Graham as a tight end, uh, you know, with Marcus Colston, Marcus Colston and Lance Horn, Devery Anderson, Drew Brees in his absolute prime. Jari Evans and Carl Nixon, they're absolute prime. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that that's an unfair comparison. But I think this team, I think this team can can hold its own with with this current era of Saints, the 2017 through. Like, I don't think that era is over yet. I think mm. I think last year was a very unfortunate dip because of. You know, every possible thing you can think of, including losing Drew Brees to start with. But I think they were going to weather that storm and then and then just got hit with everything that could possibly derail the season. But there's an argument to be made that their defense was the best it's ever been last year in the whole five year stretch. Mm. So there is a definite possibility that now that you're adding a little offense back in. But uh, um, there's a big difference between a team that could that could throw for fifty five hundred yards in 16 games. And and, um, it's just it's it's a different makeup. But I absolutely, without question, I'm predicting this team to make the playoffs, and it's a disappointment if they don't. But there are a lot of question marks on this team. So, you know, speaking speaking of the offense, Mike, um, it's been kind of hard to gauge the offense just looking, you know, from the outside looking in. Um, it seems like the defense has been, you know, has been pretty uh, – I wouldn't say dominant, but pretty, you know, pretty good as far as handling things. And you know, stifling the offense most of the training camp. Then in the preseason, you know, Jameis has been injured, so we hadn't really seen him. You know, they've kept a lot of starters out. We, you know, we have seen you know Andy Dalton kind of cook a little bit. So, I mean, how how do you like? What's your gut feeling about the offense? Watching them, like, uh, do you feel like it's coming together, or it's one of those things where it's kind of going to be a work in progress through the season with all these little different parts coming together? that I have to jail, you know, over time. Yeah, look, it, it, definite work in progress. I mean, um, James Winston's never completed a pass to Michael Thomas in an NFL game, never once. And mm. they haven't spent much time together in training camp because right when Mike started 
join an 11 on 11 then Jameis stopped and then right when Jameis came back Mike is gone so right. we still want to see what that looks like we already know now Jameis Winston and Alvin Kamara are going to be in year two together but we already have a few question marks about if that's going to be more natural for him to throw to the running back yeah. we know he's going to love Olave but he's a rookie Jarvis is new um they're gonna have a new starting left tackle whether it's Hurst or Penning so um None of these questions have been answered yet in training camp. Training camp's a little too small sample size. Obviously, they're not playing heavily in the preseason. So I'm optimistic. First of all, we're all optimistic because, I mean, the receivers, unfortunately, it was it was the worst total collection of receivers. I mean, it, it ranks down there with probably, probably, you know, once they added injuries into the mix and the guys that they were pulling out of retirement and putting oh, directly on the field yes. last year. And now you're looking at, at you know, Marquez Callaway, Traquan Smith, and Deontay Hardy as four, five, six, and, and fighting off Kirk Merritt. He's trying to earn his way on all behind Thomas and Olave and Landry. Um, that is obviously going to be so much better. But I think the sneaky one is the offensive line. Like, yeah. this team was winning games early. This team was five and two and should have been six and one because that, that, that Giants game was impossible to lose. Um, play that 99 more times and they win all 99. Like, like that was, that was a win in the bank and I can't believe it was a loss. So this was basically a six and one team last year, but they like all the flashbacks and memories of the pain, like how bad the team looked last season were after the offensive line fell apart. I mean, it didn't matter if it was Trevor Simeon, Taysom Hill, Ian Book for that obviously ridiculous game that nobody was playing, but they couldn't gain a first down because the offense, like four of their starting offensive linemen were out. And and that yeah. was just it, it was game over then. That's why Alvin Kamara couldn't run the ball. That's why no quarterback could complete the pass. That nine nothing win at Tampa. Yeah. <laughs> it was I was just holding on for dear life. Like like the offense disappeared. So uh, obviously losing Toronto Armstead is gonna hurt. But if, if you just have a reasonable amount of injuries on the offensive line. I think this is going to go back to being like, you know, a top 10, top 12 offensive line in the NFL again. And that's just as huge as the receiver upgrades. It, it absolutely is. And I think seeing the growth in Trevor Penning from week, you know, his first preseason game against the Texans to just even a week later against the Packers and kind of just reading the observations and the report and training camp, like you can, you can mentally like I'm not there. I can't see it, but I like well, I can see it on preseason games. But like you can read the growth. It sounds like he's making um at that position, which is a huge a huge thing um for the offensive line to be successful. It also sounds like, and I guess another question for you is: Do you buy this hype in Caesar Ruiz being like an average serviceable <laughs> guard <laughs> in the NFL now? <laughs> Um, well, what a shame that they draft their two guards, their two guards were drafted 13th and 24th overall, which, you know, fan bases take that more than anything in the world, but at least you, you want to have two pro ball guards if you're going to do that. And, and to, to, to say those guys are question marks is such a shame with the investments they made, but, but they should be, they should be above average NFL guards, both of them. And Andrews Pete. Caesar Ruiz is probably the best thing that ever happened to him. He's just quietly going about hey, his business every day. We talk Nobody about it all him. the time. Let's people, are almost, people are almost excited to have him back in the lineup. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's his time, baby. But, but yeah, look, Caesar Ruiz is super talented. Um, Zach, Zach Spreef was talking to us about how Doug Marone in particular is going to be really good for him because all the offensive line men have talked about how Doug Marone is like a super detailed teacher who talks a lot about technique. Eric McCoy was talking about this the other day. He said he's correct in a little, a little hitch in his step that he's had, that he's always had and that no one has ever really corrected that he's, he's working on. And, and Streif was saying that's really good for Cesar Ruiz because he needed that. And, and like basically they had no coaching for the last two years. And sometimes that's an excuse. Like you can say, Oh, well, sure. All the rookies that's that, you know, it was COVID and no off season. It's like Justin yeah. Jefferson appears to be doing okay. You know, <laughs> Joe, yeah. you know, uh, so some guys did okay uh, uh, with COVID shortened off seasons, but it does sound like, He's healthy, full off season. He's getting good coaching. He's a talented guy who's in his third year. I, I think he, it stands to read. Now, I haven't seen enough to say, 
because they don't, you know, they, you know, they don't go full speed, full tackling, full padded right. all the time in practice. He hasn't played much in the preseason, but how can it not be his best season? I mean, he should yeah. be an asset at that position uh, unless, you know, it's just never going to work out for him. But I tend to think, I tend to think, you know, healthy Andrews Pete and healthy Cesar Ruiz is going to be a, a major plus for this team. Uh, even if those guys aren't, you know, among the, the best in the league at, at, at the guard position. And then as far as Penning goes, yeah, look, I, I think Hurst is really capable and really trust, trustworthy, so they don't have to force Penning in uh, unless yeah. Hurst is ready by week one. I don't think that'll be the case. But every time Penning's on the field as a run blocker, I, I think it's going to be highlights. Whether he's playing mm-hmm. left tackle or whether he's playing that jumbo tight end role, he's going to be mm-hmm. a huge asset as a run blocker, even if, even if the whole year is a work in progress and pass protection. Oh, no, I, I completely agree being – Adam have talked about it, you know, the last couple of podcasts. Um, I think, you know, neither Adam or I really expected Penner, Penning to, like, be a day one starter. Because, look, Hurst is fine. Like, Hurst is fine at left tackle. Um, but, I mean, from, from what I've seen from Penning as a run blocker, I mean, it's it's hard to be – it's hard to enjoy watching the offensive line, but you enjoy <laughs> watching him, you know, run blocking. And as a pass protector, like – the strides he made from week one to week two of the preseason, like that was encouraging. Not that he was like just an outstanding pass protector in week two, but I'm just saying like you yeah. saw the incremental improvements. And I think that, you know, that speaks to, uh, you know, him being able to be become a, a, you know, a good player in the NFL eventually at some point. Um, another thing I wanted to hit on just as far as offense, how do you feel about this Andy Dalton thing? Like Uh-oh. something – I'm just, Uh-oh. I'm not, look, okay, we've said it again. There's no quarterback controversy. James is the starter. This is not in question. But, but, just watching the preseason game, man, it's like, damn, this Saints, <laughs> off, this Saints offense is kind of tailor-made for Andy Dalton. Like, right. he's getting the ball out. And then when you see him on the presses, he's just smiling. He just looks comfortable. He's like, I got this, you know? Like, do you get that feeling when you see him? You no, know, uh, that last one is right. Like he feels like a starting quarterback. Like mm. you know, now I'm sure we could talk to some Bears fans and talk to some Cowboys fans, and they could right. say he's not a starting quarterback anymore. But uh, but I think you're exactly right about the the offense seems built for him. Like this feels like an offense, and this is my biggest question: is I would take Jameis over Dalton on any team in the league, but this particular offense feels like an offense you would build around. 40 year old Drew Brees, Teddy Bridgewater, Andy Dalton. Like it's, it's sure handed, short, and intermediate, you know, throw it to Kamara, throw it to Jarvis, throw it to Thomas. Um, so I get that. And that's my biggest question is those are not Jameis's favorite throws. Those are sort of Jameis's mm. reluctant throws. Yeah. So is Jameis going to learn to embrace the, you know what? Pete Carmichael drew up this great play that is designed to be take two steps back, throw it to Jarvis, gain seven yards. Uh, and, and I'm not even allowed to look and see what a lot is doing. <laughs> that's right. that's my biggest out. curiosity. Ball is out. You know, Andy cool. Dalton would do that happily. He'd be like, sounds great to me. I'll throw that pass right to Jarvis Landry, just like you said. <laughs> so I- that's that that's where I think the question comes from. But my you know, the only thing I would do is maybe if you gave me a time machine and I knew Andy Dalton only cost three million and I could spend, you know, the Jameis money on on a pro bowl or somewhere oh, else. Yeah. Maybe there's maybe there's an argument to be made. But there's no quarterback controversy. I mean, Jay, I think Jameis, Jameis is upside. This offense is going to need that upside. Like yeah. I said, all those painful games where we were watching last year where they could not score a point, how bad did you miss those one-play touchdown drives from but, Jameis to Deontay Hardy when yeah, that happened? But, <laughs> but, I, but, like, on the flip side, this is just me just completely, completely just being a deviant. Like, does the offense really need that, though? Like, because with this defense, all the offense needs to do is just be consistently and just need to move. Like, I, right. I, I guess I guess the biggest question I want to – and I've, I've kind of dropped the whole Dalton Dimes, the whole Red Rifle agenda. But who's looked better in training camp? Like, just – like, you've, you've seen all the throws. I know Jameis has been, been hurt, and so he had time where he wasn't throwing, and he got ramped up slowly because of the ACL recovery. But – when just watching them, who's like looked better, like running the offense in training camp? 
Yeah, I mean, it's too tough to say because, I mean, you've been out to training camp practices. Yes, There's, I have. Today, today, well, I'll tell you what's funny is y- you never really get a flow. You get yeah. you get six p- plays in a row and two of them are run plays and nobody's tackling each other until they do things like a two-minute drill. And and I think everybody would probably agree this was maybe Jameis's best-looking practice because they did two-minute drills at the end of practice. And he yeah. scrambled a couple times. Uh, he moved him down the field. He threw the, the fourth the fourth down interception when he tried to give uh, Jawan Johnson a chance because uh, it was fourth down and, and he threw the pick. But then they came down and he threw a touchdown to Jarvis Lander. He looked really good. Uh, I, I wouldn't say he's being outshined on the practice field day in and day out. And and th- th- there's clearly an upside with Jameis. Oh, yeah. um, that that deep ball upside Ooh. is is the tiebreaker. Um, now yes. the best of yes. both worlds is if we get the Jameis we saw when they were off to that good start last year yeah. where he was like, Hey, we're winning the game and I'm not going to lose it for us. And I'm going to move the chains and I'm going to throw 14 touchdown passes in, in, you know, the first six games or whatever it was. Um, um, and then you can add in the, but if we're ever down by 11 and, and you need to hurry up offense and some, some magic, I got that uh, waiting for him too. Uh, you know, I think that's the right play for this team. Um, like I said, my only concern is, are you maximizing the absolute best you can get out of uh, Kamara, Michael Thomas and Jarvis Landry? Yeah. Um, and, and, and look, maybe Jarvis and Mike Thomas are going to make more plays down the field than we're used to seeing too. Maybe Mike Thomas has been, wait, wait, remember that catch he made in San Francisco as a rookie? Like, yep. Maybe, I knew. I was, maybe, I was at that maybe game. Maybe the reason he catches a <laughs> hundred and, Maybe the reason he kept caught 150 passes in the middle of the field was because that he couldn't get, Drew, Drew Drew couldn't get the ball. Yeah. Yeah. Water through him, you know? Yeah, no, yeah. More, snap, no more snap water, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> snap boys. I think Jameis completed one. I think Jameis completed one slant last year. <laughs> <laughs> He doesn't want he doesn't want to settle for that throw. He's like, let me uh, look down the field first, he, then, he then just I, said, I'll see he, what's he down just, here. He, he's just <laughs> wired. He's just wired that way. It's just who he is as a player. Let me check. Let me just check. <laughs> let, let I want to see what Alave's up to. I got let is Deontay see. Hardy free? Just let me check. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for bringing up that name. Um is he gonna be on the team? Is like Hardy? I, yeah, yes. I Yes. Yes, for sure. I mean, he's the kick returner for one thing. He's still a special kick returner. Now that the, the undrafted rookie that they paid a lot of money to, I, I, he might get the Blake Gilligan red shirt treatment and, and they might not pay Deontay Hardy next year, but no Hardy, you know, when, when you're figuring out your 53 man roster, and this is what they're doing with Kirk Merritt right now. What, what are the three or four different things you can do? And, and that is Hardy's right. specialty. I, I can run the deep ball. Uh, and draw the safety deep when you're not throwing it to me. I can catch two 70 yard touchdown passes a month if you want me to. Um, I can return kicks. Uh, I can try that end around that we haven't quite seen work yet, but maybe one day it will. Like, like they, they, that's that's a piece they like having. I, I don't think he's in any jeopardy. No, no. I, I mean, uh, we talked about it on this podcast where it's like it just makes sense for him to be on his team this year. Like. If you're going all in, if you're trying to maximize this roster, it makes sense for Hardy, you know, just to have him. But just just on the strength of the chemistry that him and James had last year at the deep ball. Oh um, yeah, it, it, it was it was beautiful. Like it's, just, it's like oh, he's catching the ball in stride, running into the end zone. <laughs> you know, it's just a beautiful thing to see. Uh, I mean, now moving on to the to the defense. You know, obviously everybody's expecting the defense to be, you know, like a top five, top three unit in the NFL. Some people think it's going to be like a great defense. Uh, I mean, that'll remain to be seen. But, uh, I mean, is is it the real deal? Because it it has questions. Like when you start poking holes and you look at the defensive line and all that, some questions there. Yeah, I mean, I would bet – I would. I think they're going to, I don't, I think they're going to have a hard time being as good as they were last year, but mm. that's, that's a, that's hardly a bold statement. I mean, the second half of last season, they might've been the de- best defense in the NFL. I mean, oh. they were incredible for the second half of last season. Um, and that's going to be hard to top because look, Marcus Williams had his flaws, but there's, a, it's not a coincidence that the, the 
five years he played for the Saints where, you know, they were a top four defense right. and they weren't getting torched over the top. And now you've got two safeties who play a little differently. I think that I think Tyron Matthew and Marcus Mayer are probably going to make make more plays than Marcus Williams did. But are they going to give up plays now because they play a little more aggressive and take a little more chances remains to be seen. Uh, I love the corners. I think Bradley yeah. Ro- if Bradley Roby was a starter, I would feel perfectly comfortable. He's looked so good the last mm. couple of days in particular. Mm. But Paul Nadebo is is the MVP of camp. Uh, and, and obviously, Marshawn lived up to his contract last year. C.J. Gardner-Johnson is playing great as the, in the slot. Um, so I love that. Um, you know, if we're going to list Cam Jordan and Demario Davis is probably two of the three best players on the defense. Tyron Matthew, one of the five best, six best defensive players. They're all eventually going to take a step back because they're all in their 30s. Maybe Demario Davis will never take a step back. I don't know what <laughs> what's going on with him. Right. That's incredible how good he's been. But those are guys who are who who are not on the rise in their careers. And Marcus Davenport's the big guy. Well, I, I, I would say wow. David Onimata, too. I think he could be a positive. He kind of disappeared last year coming yeah. back from the suspension. Uh, it sounds like he he's going to be a positive this year. But Marcus Davenport's the big X factor. Um, he uh, – there were stretches last year where he was the, the best player on that defense while it was the best defense in the league. And, mm. and, and it's such a shame that he can't uh, get a whole healthy off season and a whole healthy season together because like, you know, there is, there's without question, if you told me I was getting 13 healthy games out of him, just 13, you're getting a pro bowl defensive end. I think I did, mm. but it's, it's a big F. It's funny. You said that about Marcus Davenport because an even bigger what if is like Peyton Turner yeah but uh, I Peyton Turner is probably more in the Cesar Ruiz category like what a nice bonus would be if if he looked above average this year this year because I mean it's almost like his extended rookie year um you know what a nice bonus if he's like the fifth man in the rotation on the defensive line what if his career turns out to be like an Onyemata type career Marcus Davenport has a chance to be like what Trey Hendrickson somehow became out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, it that's 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 fair. Um, What's up, Ryan? Yo, I'm just gonna say this. I want you to get offended. I'm a big dude. You a big dude. Damn. And I know sometimes weight loss has been an issue that we both dealt with our our entire lives. But I want to tell you about something that I came across. About this great new company called Vertimax. Okay. Did you know that Vertimax is the leading sports performance and fitness equipment company that's used by half of D1 programs and half of the NFL and NBA teams? We have an NFL podcast. Hmm. It's used by professional leagues as well as other teams all around the world. There's the Vertimax platform and there's a Vertimax Raptor used to help athletes improve their performance on the field for almost three decades. That's wow. almost as old as you. <laughs> <laughs> I know we, we we pick on him, but did you know that we pick on him in terms of his little his workouts, but Jameis Winston actually has trained on a Vertimax Raptor and the mm. King of New Orleans himself, Drew Brees, has trained on a Vertimax platform along with other top NFL and college football pro athletes. I was just scrolling on TikTok. I saw Amari Cooper using a Vertimax machine. Wow. We know we have a lot of listeners that have kids. They're in sports. They're in soccer, baseball, football, track and field, you name it. If you're a parent and you want to help your child improve in terms of their sports performance, or maybe you just feel like you just want to get your body right for the summer, and and get fit. You need to I check out summer. You need to you need to check out Vertimax. So all you have to do is go to Vertimax.com or follow them on social media at Vertimax. That's B-E-R-T-I Max. Again, that's at B-E-R-T-I Max, Vertimax.com. Look into getting yourself a Vertimax platform, a Vertimax Raptor, and tell me you won't see the improvement. This is the story of the one. 
As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. You prepared your kids for their first steps. The first day at school, their first dance, that big test, all the wins along the way. With a College Savings Iowa 529 plan, you'll prepare them for even more. Register before May 31st for a chance to win a $1,000 contribution. Visit collegesavingsiowa.com to make the first move toward a bright future. College Savings Iowa. It's how parents get through college. Administered by the State Treasurer of Iowa. Something that you taught, you hit on Sean Payton departing, and some of our listeners, our Patreons had some good questions. Is It seems like, at least just listening and listening to like pressers from players, everyone at least initially in training camp and like midway through training camp was just saying like, just feels different. Like the vibes different. Like I knew, I just remember like Nick Vanette saying, I'm like, Nick Vanette's like the third of third string tight end. <laughs> um, but it's just like this general consensus that things felt differently in the building from what you've been able to gather or just maybe just intuition. Is there things that Dennis Allen's doing differently than Sean Payton wasn't, or was it just one of those collective like psychological things where you hear the same voice for over and over for years and years and just hearing a different voice, even though the the message may be the same is refreshing. Uh, Honestly, I've gotten a different impression. I, I, and, and I think I could see where it's dangerous, but I, I think the overwhelming feedback I've gotten is how much it feels exactly the same. Um, like to the point where I couldn't get guys to list two tiny little quirks. Like the, my, the best anecdote I got is when Dennis Allen told me the story about how he accidentally walked into Ryan Nielsen's office because it was his old office and he tried to play it off and pretend like he had something to tell him, (laughs) but no, like, and, and, and the, the, the vibe I got out of it was that players appreciate that because they can smell the BS if, if, if it's changed just for change's sake. Like if Dennis right. Allen came in here and he said, guess what? I moved all your lockers around. Now it's going to be every other locker is going to be an offensive player and a defensive player. And the meeting times are going to be at 4 p.m. And st- like, like they'd be like, this is ridiculous. And, and Dennis Allen's whole point was these guys have earned this. Like we all built this together. We built this five straight winning seasons, this winning culture. Mm. Dennis Allen got hired because they love this culture what a jerk he'd be to come in and be like, now everything's going to be different. Like he wants the players to know you, you guys have built this, you earned it and we're not going to change it because we like it. Um, and, and especially in the off season, a couple of people have made this point. Um, they, somebody said it today. I'm trying to remember. I think it was Ronald Curry said it today. Um, they won't really feel a difference until they get in the regular season, because even when Sean Payton was the head coach, during installs in the offseason, Pete Carmichael always ran the offense and Dennis Allen always ran the defense. Mm. So so Sean didn't really come in until, you know, game planning sessions and stuff. So uh, to everybody, it has it's probably weird that Sean Payton's there. And and I think when players talked about a different vibe last year was it 
I, I, I should listen to you guys more often. Can I? Am I allowed to say whatever I want? There's no yeah. editing button or whatever. I mean, last year was a total shitstorm, and and I think everybody's so relieved to be back from that. I mean, the mm. everything that happened to this team from evacuating in the middle of the third preseason mm-hmm. week to spending six weeks in Dallas to playing in Jacksonville to all the COVID games they had. So that's why the vibe is different. But as far as things feeling different, like in the building i think everybody like i i bet i bet once a week they're like oh yeah sean thing's not here anymore I, that's more of the vibe i've gotten now interesting when you tell me to predict the record i'm not going to short change sean payton and mm-hmm. i think probably what he is is one of the all-time like he's probably one of the all-time game planners from team to team he's probably one of the all-time adjusters from situation to situation i mean Every time this team ever went out of town for a week, like Seattle for a week and Drew Brees breaks his thumb, they beat the Seahawks and they've won every time they've gone to London and they go to Dallas and he comes up with this Jacksonville scenario and they dominate the Packers in Jacksonville. Like he's going to be missed. I just, I don't know how many wins to put on that. And I, the one thing I know is if they're one in three, everyone's going to say, well, all the Saints tried to do is pretend like Sean Payton was still there. They didn't change anybody. They just yeah. brought back all their old coaches, and that was their fault. They should have changed, you know. But for now, um, I, I, for, I forget every once in a while that it's like, man, this is just the same team as last year, but they've added – oh, well, they lost, you know, one of the greatest coaches in NFL history. But besides that, they're cool. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, which is, you know, why I don't really, you know um, – I don't get crazy about some of the, like, the big national media that's – that might be a little down on the center because it's understandable. It's like, okay, Jameis Winston, Jameis Winston is your starting quarterback and you lost Sean Payton. Like that has to mean something, right? But I yeah. don't know, maybe it, I'm not going to say it doesn't mean anything, but maybe, you know, they are able to win in just a different way. Um, and I'm so interested in Pete Carmichael because, I mean, look, Sean Payton is just such a, dominant force when he walks into a room and that's just not Pete. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like you don't know Pete. Right. There. Right. Right. And it's, it's like, so I'm just, well, I'm just so interested to see how that plays out when it comes to games. Cause obviously he's called plays. He's, you know, my God, he's been in the system forever. He knows it. He helped build forth. it. I mean, he, build he, it. Yeah. He, he showed up, he showed up with, with Peyton and Breeze and, and New Breeze and and they wrote it. Those three guys wrote this offense together. Yeah, right. he's he's been here for the whole shebang. Yeah. So it's like my question is, you know, does he have it in him to be like, you know, this coming week we're going to target this safety because this safety leans this way, you know, when this route is, you know, what I'm saying like what Sean yeah, Payton did I, I, week look, to week. I'm so interested you, to see that. You're, he that's absolutely him i mean that is him that that's he's as much of that as sean payton ever was and actually i've heard some inklings where payton's the one who had to real you know everybody thinks payton's like the riverboat gambler and a lot of times payton's the one who's had to real you know we Uh went through all the years we went through all the years where the fans would hate sean payton because he didn't run the ball you know Mm. the uh the, you got to run 30 times to win a game. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I think a lot of that was Pete Carmichael doesn't want to waste time running. You know, he has I too many that. exotic. He has too I many exotic that. designs. Yeah. He's, I'm, he's every bit of that. He's you know, the dynamic personality is the biggest difference. It's probably the main reason why um, he's never been a head coach. Um, um, but as far as being in the film room and being like, Oh, we're going to, we're going to destroy this guy because this is our ticket to winning. It's as much Pete as it is Sean Payton. Definitely. So I guess just a follow up that I have on from that is, do you know like what went into like, well, first Pete was going to like take a step back and then I get came across like they had to like talk him into or convince him to become the OC. And it's just something that Ryan and I have said, said, you know, kind of during the off season, like, like, Anytime someone's had to have, had to be talked into a job, it's not it's not like the best. Yeah. Like, so do you know like what the heck happened with that? Like, it was just so so weird. Yeah, I mean, I, I my understanding of it is that his his initial instinct was this would be the good time to transition. Uh, you know, step back for a year, take a year off, you know, like um, let Dennis bring in his own guy, let me be in a senior advisory role or something like that. <laughs> the part the part that I cannot say for sure is, I mean, we saw some of the people they interviewed 
And it's like, did they have those interviews? And did they say, no, Pete, you can't leave. <laughs> uh, right. But, uh, but it didn't take long. I mean, I, I, I don't know if he discussed it and he said, you know, let me take two weeks to think about it. You guys take two weeks to think about it. Let's reconvene, you know, but it wasn't a, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a pulling teeth situation, but he definitely considered, um, you know, taking it, taking a step back this year after, uh, well, I guess what, what is it for him? It would have been, uh, this would have been his 17th straight years, you know? Um, so, um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think any of that signifies that his heart's not in it or that, you know, any any concern, anything concerning about that. I think I think once they decided to go with him, it, he's been all in, you know, the entire time. So, Is it as refreshing for you as it is for us <laughs> when you guys say it. Say ask, it. ask Dennis Allen, you know, why did so-and-so mispractice? And he gives an answer. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Or, I, no, you know, what's funny is I feel bad for him because I know he wants to tell us that he doesn't want to give that answer. And my favorite is my favorite is when he's like, we're not going to go through all the injuries. I mean, it's just a left ankle that's going to take 10 days to recover from. But I'm not going to tell you anything besides that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he wants to he wants to not tell the the dirty little secret about Sean Payton, though, is that that he would give the answer 35 percent of the time, too. Um, uh mm-hmm. Now, 35% of the time, he'd yell at somebody and say, you know we don't answer those questions. But 35% of the time, he would give the exact answer, too. So he had to keep taking those shots. But, you know, Dennis hasn't, hasn't decided to yell at anybody yet. But, uh, um, you know, it's still the honeymoon stage. That's actually one of the questions is, being someone in the media, do you notice the difference or, you know, of how potentially DA maybe treats the media as opposed to how Sean Payton did as as head coach or does it seem well uh, yeah i would say early on one one thing that i did notice is i'd say in that media relationship trying to get a feel for you know if you've covered a bunch of sports and a a bunch of events every once in a while you like you know you go from the nfl where they act like the cia and then you go cover something where they're happy to have you there and they roll out the red carpet for you and i like i wouldn't say dennis has been that and and i think it's a reminder that oh yeah he was a head coach for three years and got run out of town with bad press and Mm. and probably ended up having a messy divorce with the media and probably got beat up a lot and probably had people finding sources in the building saying negative things about him so i think he's on guard um i think he's been i think he's been you know friendly with the media i think he's been a little more open uh with with some access things maybe not as you know like trying to control every single thing but uh, he's not a pushover either like uh, you know i I, I think i've been reminded a couple times that this this isn't his first road he's not just happy to be here he's like he's like some things that didn't go right the first time i'm not you know i'm not gonna let any of that stuff happen the second time um which frankly he could be a real uh guinea pig for um for a lot of failed first time coaches you know if he's a success That could be a copycat because I would think being a head coach a second time is probably a really smart hire in general, yeah. but yeah. it's a really, really tough sell. Like, and, and the Saints for five years to get this opportunity. And he was a guy who went, you know, was it eight and 24? Like think about, coaches who've been to the playoffs like is Matt Nagy ever going to get another chance he he went to the playoffs and he might you know it's like once you fail your name is mud uh but you know if if Dennis Allen has success maybe maybe in a copycat league people will be like you know what maybe maybe a second time head coach is a good idea (laughs) Uh, especially especially like his situation was so weird because he had like been a DC for like one year then got hired you know he was kind of on that fast track and he went to the Raiders at yeah. probably their worst time ever. Like Al Davis had just died, had a new own, you know, son was taking over, had like 80 million in dead money. It was just like their roster was a mess. So I think, you know, with him, I kind of understood why he was kind of deserved a second chance, especially what he was able to show the last couple of years as defensive coordinator for the Saints. Like the Saints, Saints has had like most terrible defense ever 
for years, and he yeah. was able to come in. Obviously, that has a lot to do with also Jeff Ireland coming in and getting some talent in the building. But yeah. make no mistake, man. Like it's hard. Like nobody has beat Tom Brady more than Dennis Allen's defense. Like it's, that's, it's, that's wild. Just, that's wild. To wild. See. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. You know, Dennis Allen and Jeff Ireland got hired in the same Senior Bowl week. That's a pretty oh, good yeah. week. They had a pretty good week that that week. <laughs> then, in the middle of a dark stretch for the Saints, they they did something right that week. <laughs> and then after the Senior Bowl, they followed it up with with Pete and stuff on Aunt Anthony and <laughs> draft. Um, oh, speaking speak, speaking of picks, I don't. I'm, I, I ask you to be a little concise about it because I know it'll, Ryan can just go on for for days oh, about it. What 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 are we doing with Zach Bond? What are they what are they doing with Zach Bond? Does he oh exist? Can he rush the passer? He's not a linebacker. They want him to be a linebacker, but he's like the third or fourth string linebacker. Like Pete Warner's hurt and has a groin injury that's probably going to nag him the rest of the year. Like, like, like we have this third round pick, and it's just like you know, like if you're ever like going to a mechanic and they're like looking at your car and they're like. Yeah, I just I, I just don't know what's going on with it. Like that's how I feel like the Saints are with with Zach Bond. They're just like I, I don't I don't know what it is. What does he do? Special I'm not going to put it. I, I I'm I'm not going to put him on my 53 man roster projection the way the other linebackers mm. are playing right now too. I mean, it's going to be really tough. Now, that's a position where we can watch these preseason games and we can say, you know, look how good John Bostic looked on that play look how good chase hansen looked on that play good look how good nephi sewell looked on that play and it's all going to come down to all right who who does who does darren rizzy pick because who's going to play special teams i mean i think andrew dowell is going to make the team because that you know the the fourth and fifth linebackers are basically only playing special teams and then they they play linebacker only if needed in case of emergency so uh, but i i don't have an indication that he's going to win a job based on special teams and i think eric yeah. wilson's going to make this team i think Caden ellis is going to make this team i think andrew dowell is going to make this team i think it's going to be hard to cut maybe nephi swill after how he's looked these last couple days uh, or the last couple weeks and and like i said bostic had a good game so uh uh, Zach Bond might might go the way of of one of those. It, it it didn't happen, and they ran out of time to make it happen. Uh, um, I, I I don't see the path. I don't see the path. I mean, I'm a lot more optimistic. And obviously, they were first round picks, and uh, you know Cesar Ruiz and and Peyton Turner that we talked about earlier. But you know, uh, I mean, it, you know, Bond couldn't couldn't find his way last year, um, and, and now he's facing a more crowd. And and those guys are playing ahead of him too every day in practice. I I, I don't see it. I really don't. Rob, Rob Nikovich season. It, I'm so, I was about to say it reminds me so much of Rob Nikovich. Man, it's like he. I guarantee. I'm not going to say I guarantee it, but man, if Zach Bond gets claimed by the Patriots. Yeah, no, I, I just, no I just, I know exactly what's going to happen. I know exactly what's going. The dude just rushed the passer with Wisconsin, and I was well, not. A, we was not. A, we weren't a huge fans of him, but it was like at least that's what he does. And I remember right. I heard Dennis Allen. He was talking about like, oh, we thought about asking uh, Taysom Hill to come play strong side linebacker. I'm like, if you have wait, that much, wait, did did I miss that? <laughs> <laughs> no, he mentioned it one person, and I was like. Okay, if you can think outside the box like that, why, why can't we at least try Zach Bond as an edge rusher? As just a pure, like no, look, here's the thing. Yeah, look, that is one thing, and you can't, you can't, you can't blame the Saints for it because Sean Payton believe. Look, he had five different defensive coordinators, and they never wavered from this. But certainly, Dennis Allen believes it. Then they bring in Jeff Ireland, who believes it. There is a reason why all their defensive ends. I mean, shoot, they, they looked at Carl Granderson and they said, you know, 270s too light. You got to be 285. Yeah, like, they like they the don't clone. they don't have any. They've never had any any. Like, and when and though every once in a while when they do draft one of those guys, they have no idea what to do with them. Ninkovich, how about Haoli Kakaha? First year yeah. he comes in here, they're like, all right, well, the guy had 30 sacks over the last two years. Let's try it out. Let's try a 6'2", 250-pound pass rusher. Uh, uh, they try moving him to strong side le- linebacker yep. the they second sure year. Did. He's gone the third year. They they just – Martez Wilson, they're like, yeah, boy, he looks like a great player. They, Tez Wilson. They're just like – 
They're like, you are not playing defensive end for us if you don't weigh at least 285 and you're not at least 6'3". Uh, so let's move you to a linebacker position. And, oh, that's not your natural position. All right, well, you just don't fit on this team. And you, know what? You, you could say that is not thinking outside the box, but there's, you know, who's it the just, best run defense in the NFL over the last four years? It's probably because of the way they like to have big defensive linemen and big linebackers. It just, I think they remind me a lot of how they try to kind of fit this, like the square peg in the round hole is just like the Arizona Cardinals recently. Like, let's, let's draft Isaiah Simmons, but like, we don't, like, is he going to be safety? Is going to be a linebacker? Let's draft right. like Xavier Collins. Oh, like, we yeah. don't, we don't know. Hassan Reddick, is he a linebacker? He's an edge. Like, it's shit that. I'm not saying it's to that degree because I think the Cardinals have been like atrocious about it. Like, right. Absolutely. Well, they atrocious. actually were one of the, the Cardinals were one of the pioneers of the, you know, the 230 pound linebacker who's actually yeah. plays like a safety. They, they did that with a couple of guys and had some success, but maybe they right. got too cute. <laughs> yeah. It's just funny to me, but then, yeah. you know, uh, but no, look, Hurts... don't, 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 if you are an agent and you're listening to this podcast and you've got a six foot two, 235 pound edge rusher, don't let him sign with the Saints. No, don't. No, no. <laughs> they won't. They might. They might tell you they like him, but they won't know what to do with him. Like, if we're <laughs> being honest, like who was like the the last true, like, I don't know, speed edge rusher that was on the team was was it like Junior Galette? Because I don't Gallette, really that was it. Yeah, it was, but it was Gallette. look, Galette Galette was close, and and was he six two two seventy six three two seventy he he was right on the border and that worked out for him i think uh, i'm but just speaking more to li- just how like how they win right like yeah, yeah. trey hendrickson he uh, should oh. he, his his bio read like that but he was he was bigger he was yeah like his bio read like he might be a tweener edge rusher but but he showed up and you know he was tall enough and they put some weight on him and um mm. um yeah nobody's they have not you know the, the only small linebacker that I can think of that, that you know, because they, they feel the same way about linebackers as they do about, like, uh, Jonathan Casillas had a little good run there for a oh, little while, yeah, and that was sure again. Did. Well, Quan, I mean, Quan for the last couple of years, but honestly, uh, I think there's a reason why, you know, uh, I think Quan flashed, but but I, I don't think they felt like he held up enough either. Like, it's just they they have a belief on what the, the front seven guys uh, are supposed to do down in and down out. And like I said, um the defensive line has been the strength of this team over the last five years and the front seven has been, and and they've been the number one run defense in the league over those five years. So to all of a sudden yeah. try to get cute with, with little guys who, who fly around the edge. Um, that's just not what they do. Number one run defense, except against Jalen hurts and yeah. these mobile QBs. Yeah. Get outside well, no, the no, not quick. mobile QBs, plural, <laughs> just that one damn team, man. It's unbelievable. But like it, it's funny because the the reason they struggle so and we're we're gonna see this season right because I believe they play the Ravens this year too right am I on the schedule I'm not, unless I'm tripping they do right? on Monday Night Football yeah yeah so like I I think Ryan had tweeted this months ago and I even as someone who loves football as much as I like I don't think I even realized it is that he just pretty much illustrated the the reason why they struggle with quarterback or struggle with Jalen Hurts so much is that. They just don't have the edge rushers that have the speed to contain them because they're they're built exactly how we're talking, like yeah. power built. But once he gets out to the edge, there's there's like no one on the team that can that can chase him down. Um, so they they see Jalen Hurts this year, they see Lamar Jackson this year. Uh, I'm and I was I I saw Marcus Mariota in week one and and I saw him against the Lions. I'm like. Ooh. I said, man, they are going to struggle to contain Marcus Mariota. Like, he's going to at least run for 50-plus yards, at least, like, scrambling. It, I just – it's a feeling I have. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of the ones where you, you – it's one of those things where you you kind of t- give and take. Like, we're going to completely take the run game away from the running back, but it may cause us potentially to be, you know, give up scrambling. Well, that's what's so – that's what's so weird about those Philly games. I, I wish I could call this up while well, well, I am I might be exaggerating this, but I might not be. I think you remember they have this stat of 100 yard rushers. They've gone mm-hmm. like 70 games or something like that without yeah. allowing a 100 yes. yard shark, except oh, Jalen yeah. Hurts twice and Miles Sanders twice. Yes. Both, yes. both, both at the same time in the same game. Hilarious. <laughs> oh, um, man. 
you don't, brought up uh, Zach. You brought up Zach Bond. It, it kind of, kind of, as a prelude, precursor to. Besides him, who are maybe some surprise cuts you could see when it gets down to cutting down to the fifty-three? It, it's a tough cut, and and I guess that speaks to. Um, it's funny how everybody is like, uh, uh, you know the saints always have the fewest draft picks of anyone year in and year out, but it's so hard to make this team. Like I I'm not positive an undrafted rookie is going to make this team this year. Um, mm. um, I, I actually, I think Lewis kid, the offensive tackle might be the one who has the best chance. Now, uh, Abram Smith's oh. going to have a tough time. I think if, yeah. if they keep, if they keep Dwayne Washington and Tony Jones jr. And certainly if they decide to keep Kirk Merritt, I mean, receiver is where the, Receivers where the surprise is going to happen, yes. and it depends. It depends if you consider cutting Kirk Merritt a surprise because he's had such a good camp and he's been getting so much notoriety, or obviously they have to cut Traquan Smith or Marquez Callaway. And mm. and I don't. I, I'm going to keep predicting the same six guys make it. And unfortunately, I mean Callaway has really come on strong and, and played a lot of valuable snaps, but I think it's because he's the backup X, and Mike has been. Uh, out of practice but if you're picking which five are going to be active on game day obviously we know who the top three are obviously we talked about Deontay Hardy and then Traquan Smith is going to make this team because he's the best blocking receiver he didn't even have to get one ball thrown his way like I know everybody this is the one that's going to make everyone so mad if Traquan Smith makes the team and Kirk Merritt doesn't everyone's going to lose their minds but they don't need six pass catching receivers if Traquan Smith does make the team it'll be because he's their best blocking receiver and and then week one we're going to see Marquez Cal is inactive on game day well it's like you don't need to throw to six guys like what else do you do um mm. so that's where the surprises are going to have to happen now obviously injuries fix everything if if a guy you know if Mike's not active I, I I don't have any reason to think he won't be active week one you know then Marquez Callaway plays but um but that's going to be that's going to be where people are going to be upset uh, or surprised or, you know, because, uh, you know, they're not keeping seven receivers. And if they do keep seven receivers, there's no room for seven receivers to be playing active on game day. Um, and they can't sustain that all year long once the injuries kick in. Um, I think the defensive line is going to be tough. Like the, the one I have drawn up right now. I, I don't have the, uh, you know, the, uh, was it a sixth round draft pick, uh, Jackson? Is he Jordan Jackson. Or sixth? Was he fifth or sixth fifth. round pick? Fifth, I think. Sixth. Okay, he was. The sixth. linebacker was fifth and the defensive tackle was sixth. Ah, but I uh, twitched them. Either him or Taco Charlton or, uh, you know, uh, Josh Black, who's looked really good in camp. I, I you know, I'm going to have to force a spot for one of those guys. Um, tight end. If they're going to keep a fullback, which they always do, does that mean? You know, Nick Vanette doesn't make the team, but he's mm. their best blocking tight end. I like uh, uh, there's there's places where the injuries will probably solve all of this. But, um, you know, I've got if I was going to write down without doing the math, I'd write down 59 names and I'd be like, oh, shoot, I thought all 59 of these guys were going to make it. Right. Right. That's going to be so interesting to see how it plays out, man. Man, uh, it's tough. I mean, you could tell. They well, wanted, I'll wanted. give you the. I don't think Ian Book. I, I think this oh, shouldn't surprise anybody after he's oh, been there. But no, um, um, the Ian Book conversation to me is, I, I'd be very surprised if they use a fifty-three man roster spot. I'm now. I think he'll stay on the practice squad and and still be the third quarterback. And if they need to activate him on a game day, they will you know, play those musical chairs. But I think it's really hard with what he's shown so far to think a team is going to claim him and he wouldn't pass through waivers because, you know, uh, I'd be surprised if that happens. Obviously, it does every once in a while. So uh, technically, you could say he's a surprise cut because we haven't seen the Saints go with only two quarterbacks on the roster in a long time. But the greater conversation with Ian Book is if Jameis or Andy Dalton miss the game, then they really have the tough decision to make. Is he your number two on game day? Or do you have to go out and find the new version of Trevor Simeon? Like, like, do they trust in book enough to ever be one snap away from playing this season? Uh, oh. And that's a huge question. Is, is the Taysom is like DA just so done with the Taysom experience? Like he wouldn't no, even I don't, consider it. I think I, I, I look it, and it, it might depend if it's a week, if, if, you know, Andy Dalton's on the COVID list this week, you, you know, you don't change everything, but you know, if the same thing happened and you know, like one of them tore an ACL and, and you're like, all right, long-term, what are we going to do? I, I think Taysom would be back in the conversation. I really do. Uh, 
Taysom won a lot of games, though, man. Like he sure did. <laughs> we talk right? about Taysom, but he won a lot of games. <laughs> you know, it, it's weird because we, you know, we talk about the defense a lot. It's like when the when the deep when the team is like up against a wall, man, that defense steps up. Like they're like, we well, yeah, because like every the, blade. <laughs> the defense is like we we got Taysom at quarterback. Oh <laughs> lord, we 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 gotta bring it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll tell you what, this is a whole different pod, but. I, 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 so this is my 18th year covering the Saints. I think my number one biggest disappointment is that when it was finally time to be like, all right, it's time for the Taysom offense, I can't believe what it looked like. Like, right. oh. I thought, I thought Keep it was going to look like Josh Allen. I thought it was going to be so unimagined. I thought it was going to be if the first guy is open, uh, he completed 70% of his passes too. It's not like he couldn't complete a pass. If the first guy is open, because Sean Payton and Pete Carmichael designed a great play, I'll complete it to him. And if he's not, then I'll run. Like, I cannot believe how much time he stood in the pocket and how many sack fumbles and how he panicked and tried to throw it behind Alvin Kamara. Why was it not one read and run? And, and like, right. I, I can't and, believe and that didn't happen. <laughs> I remember, I remember when, like, that all happened. And I was complaining about the same thing on Twitter. And then, like, the response was like, well, like, it, you know, they, they game plan for, like, you know, they, this is what Sean Payton's office is. You can't just completely change an office. I'm like, this man is the greatest, like, one of the greatest offensive of football minds, like, of all time. You're telling <laughs> me that you, could, you couldn't, for a couple of weeks, just come up with, a different offense, like, and the worst part was he play, was playing in Philly while Jalen Hurts was doing right. the exact thing Jason oh, should have been doing to them. Oh, Jalen right. Hurts complete what did he complete eleven passes and he ran exactly. thirty times. It's like that's what Taysom should look like. It's and, doing it right in front of you. What well, annoying thing was was it was always <laughs> like like the explanation would be, well, you know, Jameis is the or whoever you know whoever is the number two. But we need a week to plan and game plan to have Taysom as yes. quarterback. Yeah, because the you know because yeah. the yeah. offense is so different. But it's like no, it's not different. Like y'all trying to make him Drew Brees. It's like no, uh, like, let him run around and just do his thing. Uh, uh, it is what it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I I only have I have two more. I don't know if Ryan has any more. Then to get you out of here. We don't want to take up too much of your time. Ryan, do you want to go? No. Or do you, you, oh no, you no, go ahead. go ahead. Um, one one I'll I'll have is how how difficult was it being in the media when the whole reports the Saints were interested in Deshaun Watson came out and kind of having obviously you work for ESPN so you have to report the facts and the news um what's coming out but how hard how hard was that of kind of towing that line of, all right, I have to report this, but I may feel like a certain way about it. Like of like, can I, should I say this about if, you know, how I feel about the situation, how hard was that for you? Someone who actually is in the media that that had to deal with it. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think one thing that made that easier for me is, is I don't express, um, opinions like i'm obviously not a columnist i don't express those kind of opinions constantly so 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 almost like coming out and 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 all of a sudden becoming like the you know and i'm also not the most as you guys can tell active guy like constantly sharing everything i'm thinking on twitter so that would have been a change in how i approach my job for that situation and and i did wonder if that situation called for that i'm like do i have a responsibility to you know, oh, Mike Triplett, who never, you know, who doesn't usually do this sort of thing is coming out and saying things now that he doesn't normally do. But my approach was absolutely going to be, and I commend Jake Trotter, who ended up being the one who got him in Cleveland, was I was going to be the guy who didn't let him off the hook in the press conference. I wasn't going to let it be, I wasn't going to let them just be like, oh, we did our due diligence and we feel very comfortable. And, and I'll tell you what, I was almost, I don't want to say like, like when I saw Jake Trotter, somebody put like the transcript out of there and it said like, you know, Andrew Barry Trotter, Andrew Barry Trotter, Andrew Barry Trotter, um, and gave him a lot of credit for, no, I'm not accepting that answer. I want to specifically know you guys said this and you did this. I'd mm-hmm. like to think that's how I would have, that would have been more in line with how I do my job. And, and that's what I think my responsibility was. Uh, but, 
but yeah, no, I, I did not want my job to be, I like covering a football team and talking about football. And I know a lot of times it's about more than football. Um, I, I'm glad I'm not covering a football team where that is the entire storyline all year round. And uh, um, I think they really dodged a bullet there for sure. Um, thank, thank you. Cause I, it was just something, it, it was something that really, really like gotten, gotten to like Ryan and, and my, like our crawl. It just made us feel like it was to the point where we were just going to continue to do the podcast and it just not be a Saints podcast. We didn't know what we we're going to change it to. We were, you know, movies, pop culture. It didn't matter. We just at that yes. point, if they had landed him, like we were just like, all right, like we're, we're done. And it, I still think, I, guess. I get it. I, I mean, I could see how that would have put a real dilemma in, in in fans. I mean, it's tough. Unfortunately, it's tough because every team you cut. Look, I'm a diehard Cubs fan, and and uh, um, they won their World Series after trading for Aroldis Chapman. Uh, you know, and I mean, like those are those are tough tough things you have to weigh as a sports fan, and and uh, uh, I get it. That would have been that would have been it. It would have been a it would have been a very difficult vibe it, it it it's hard to have yeah it would have been hard to have the same kind of conversations we're having around the team right now like i'd much rather this like i if yes deshaun watson is light years better than james Watson, james winston and this today but i like much rather talking about this than talking about you know 27 cases and did he really accept responsibility and train and suspensions and is he really this? And they really is. He, oh my God! I just would not want to have to talk about that. I, I I'm sure you as like a, you know, as a you know someone that comes to Saints wants no part of that. Like, yeah, <laughs> let's talk about football. You know, whenever whenever it can't look. I mean, look, I I take my responsibility seriously, and and I don't I, I don't I'm not a. I just want to have blinders on and just talk about football. But I enjoy the football talk the most. That's for sure. Yeah. No, it's 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 a lot better that this it's not something that we have to talk about it as fans. It's it still kind of still peaks like kind of pops in my mind a little bit of like they were really interested in him and I get upset and then <laughs> I, I, I just I just shake my head because like it was it just it was just a really disappointing feeling. Um, the last thing I I have I feel like we're eating the podcast so like. Like tough fucking questions, uh, not tough questions, but something that Ryan and I have just talked about, noticed, just brought up since since we've done this podcast, we've been to the Senior Bowl, we've done, you know, thing, you know, media ish things, and we talked about it recently. This podcast is just kind of for for all intents and purposes, besides maybe a few people, like the lack of diversity, um, and those who like who cover the Saints and the media that covers the Saints and the Louisiana area is in the saints is just, a, you know, such a, a vibe and a culture and, you know, predominantly African-American and black and what, how, how can that be, be fixed? Um, you know, you have John Henry, you have Rod, Rod Walker. Um, you, uh, you have Ross Jackson who are, who are great. Um, so yeah, people of color, like how, how, is is that on the media companies for like not hiring like what how how can that and how can we be better represented um in in the world of people those who cover the saints yeah it's a tough it's a tough question and i've noticed it too and i'm well aware of the conversation and and it's you know, it's a tough position for me to be in too, because, you know, I, we, we talked earlier about uh, <laughs> my, my free agency and looking for jobs. And, you know, I, I like to think that my resume makes me a great candidate, but why am I lucky enough to have such a great resume? Because, you know, uh, I, you know, didn't, didn't face the barriers that I'm sure a lot of other people faced when I first got into the business to build that resume in the first place. I, I think the conversation over how do you get a job in media period, is really, really difficult right now. Um, I, I, I stand there with, with a blank stare on my face whenever I ask me, hey, I, love, I, I, I want to be a sports writer just like you. What do I do? I'm like, well, when I was in college, I got a newspaper internship at the paper, and they don't have those anymore. <laughs> at the paper. Newspapers don't hire people anymore. 
but but then again you've got you know you've got you guys you've got nick underhill you've got john, john Hendricks, you've got ross jackson uh maddie i mean the amount of self-made people who have become really successful in this industry just by starting out with a podcast or a blog or you know and, and developing a following um there's so many avenues in now that aren't even really, you know, that are almost up to the people and not even really up to the people who are hiring at the TV station or mm. the, or the newspaper. Um, and you can't be denied. Uh, but, but it's tough. I mean, I, I just have never really personally been in a position to be making those decisions to be hiring. I mean, certainly when I've recommended, um, you know, I, I, I think, I think it's been a big focus on the the 32 for 32 NFL nation uh, reporters. I, I think, I think our diversity has improved as that's gone along uh, recent hires that we've made. Obviously Catherine's replacing me right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that it, anytime I'm in a position to be able to do something about it, um, I'd like to think that I could, but me being able to tell you, I have the answers or I, I know exactly why it hasn't happened i mean the the in my case i'm you know i'm willing to admit i'm 46 years old i've this i've been a sports writer for 25 years um maybe a lot more people when i entered the business you know came from my kind of background looked like me and and those kind of people have continued to get hired because we you know we have the longer track record and the resume and then we you know uh, fortunately I was the one that ESPN hired because I think I had earned it on merit by then, but you know, why did I have an opportunity? Yeah, it's, it's tough. It really is tough. I, obviously I wish I had the answers to that question, but, um, uh, but I'm aware of it. No question about it. And, and I agree with you that I'd like to see even more. This, this is my last one, Mike. And I thank you for that answer. Um, Malcolm Jenkins, like I remember, do you do you miss the old Nola.com comment section? Because I remember <laughs> you used to bet so hard for Malcolm Jenkins. And you know, man, when, thank you for recognizing that. <laughs> and for him to end his look, career. I didn't, and just, I didn't just man, I didn't just bat hard for him either. I I, I nailed it. Like I, I I he needed a change of scenery. This is the same conversation we're having about. Zach Bond and Howley Kakaha. Yep. Like it was yep. not happening for him here. But I knew he was so good. And I was just like, this dude, <laughs> I think I probably wrote, this dude is going to leave the Saints and he's going to go to three Pro Bowls and he's going to win a <laughs> Super Bowl. Yeah. Like I was so sure. I was like, man, I still, I'm still like, oh my goodness. Uh, you called the, it. The, Mal the Malcolm Jenkins. Against hate, and you couldn't defend it either because it just didn't happen for the guy here. Right, like, right. like I would have drafted him over and over again for for my other teams, but he, you know, I, he. There was a while where being a D back for the Saints was being like a pitcher in Colorado. Mm -hmm. You know, he just needed out. <laughs> um, I, I don't have any more. It sounds like you called your shot. Um, in regards to. To Malcolm Jenkins, we we truly appreciate you you coming on. Um, we we love your work. I I've, I've been following you since I years now years. It's it's yeah. been a extremely long time. You do such an awesome job covering the team. Um, and we we appreciate you. like and I and I just want like we like Ryan and I know you are absolutely one of like a person who deserves to get promotions and things like that based on um, your work because your work speaks for itself um but i also did just want to get your you know just your input because you're you're in the media right we're we're not like we're like pseudo media but yeah, yeah, like yeah. you're you're in it and i i do appreciate you acknowledging that it is a it's a bigger conversation you know on the on the whole that that needs to be had but i think you have provided us and the listeners a shit ton of information and, and yeah. insight because you know reading reports like in, in observations is, is one thing but like actually like hearing it is two completely different things um so thank you so much for for joining us you're in the esteem club of three people oh three man Who's on. who's ahead of me? Who's ahead of me? What what do I have to do? What it was what's the leaderboard look like? Who's been on 
yeah, Greg's on there for sure. I think Col Greg Cosell has been on yeah. three times as well. Three or four, like four. four times, yeah, man. Tony Pauline's two. Cat's been on twice. So you're like you're 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 up there. Um, I do want to say one thing. So I don't know if there's a mechanical bull in New Orleans, mm -hmm. but if there is, you when I'm there for the Raiders game you have to ride the bull. I don't I don't know why you backed out at <laughs> in LA. It was me, you and Nick, and then we went to that that comedy show. You backed out, you didn't ride the bull. Next time in New Orleans, you got you gotta ride the bull. It's it's, it's here's the thing. Not only have I ridden mechanical bulls, I had ridden that bull at the saddle ranch I remember. LA many times. I remember I didn't have anything to prove. <laughs> I'm comfortable with who I am. You know, Nick had never ridden the bull. You can, you know, so if you had never done it, you have to do it. But once you've ridden a mechanical bull enough times in your life, you can comfortably move on from that activity. <laughs> That's not that was not the first time. So there there used to be two saddle ranches in LA. Now there's just one. Um, but I have that was like the third or fourth time I had ridden the bull at a saddle ranch. But that, that was just that was just the vibe. That was it. And then they played the Rams the next day and got fucking killed because of whatever. <laughs> was but, that wait a minute? Was that Drew Brees injury Rams or that was a no? That was no. Uh, it wasn't. That was, that was like wait. That was the previous trip. They yeah, got killed that, every time they go there. Have they? <laughs> have they ever beaten the? They beaten the Chargers in San Diego. Yeah, yeah. That's have the game. I beat the, the Rams I, I in L.A. and my. I don't Saints think so. Lifetime, I don't, I think, don't so. think so, and and not even close, right? No, that was like the game Ooh. where like AK busted like a seventy yard touchdown, yeah. and Brandon Coleman had a great block on the edge. Um, <laughs> Brandon Coleman, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then Sean Payton was like, "No, no more Alvin Kamara." Yeah, <laughs> it was such a weird <laughs> fucking dumb called game, bro. Just dumb. Anyway, anyway. Thank you so much for coming on, Mike. Uh, for taking the time with us. I know it's late there. We appreciate it. This was this was great. Um, follow Mike on Twitter at Mike Triplet. Uh, read his articles at ESPN.com. Saints related, fantasy football related. Uh, I don't know why I, I didn't think of. We should have gotten you in like one of the many fantasy football leagues we're doing with our with our listeners on the pod. But Thank you, thank you so much. Um, best is best to you, and continue to to strive and and get all the great things that you deserve, man. Hell yeah! All right, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, thanks Mike. Mike. And with that, we're out. Peace. This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows granger has got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.